I'm Erin O'Reardon. Welcome to episode 12 of Cut by me and Ted Ellington. You're listening to Storytime with Erin O'Reardon. If you haven't already heard episode 11 of Cut, click the link right here. Chapter 18, November 1999. At 3.30 in the morning, Bridget sat on the living room sofa. Her notebook lay open on the coffee table next to a pot of coffee. Jessamine didn't understand Bridget's bouts of insomnia and didn't like them. She wouldn't like it if she saw Bridget pouring sugar and cream directly into the pot and drinking from it in big gulps, but Bridget's dad was in town and Jessamine was gone. Bridget figured she wouldn't see Jessamine for two to three days. Isn't it beautiful, she said to her mom's Pomeranian Chester, how we spend time together as a family? Chester said nothing. Bridget turned back to her notes and tried to imagine what would be on the history midterm. It was the end of November, still three weeks away from midterms, but her schedule would be filled with basketball. Recruiters were in town and Coach Longley stepped up practice from three to five times a week. As good as she was on court, Bridget knew she couldn't let her grades slip if she hoped for a full scholarship. And Bridget aimed high. She wanted to go to one of the top basketball schools, maybe UConn or Georgetown. Chester suddenly sprang to life, running into Jessamine's bedroom and barking at the window. Bridget ran after him and swatted his hindquarters with a closed fist. Shut up, stupid dog, she said. Chester walked around in angry circles, baring his tiny teeth. Nothing's there. Just to be sure, she peered between the wooden slats of the blinds. Someone was there, looking up at the yew tree that reached Bridget's bedroom window. Hiking up her long black skirt, as if about to climb the branches, stood Fred. Bridget pushed the blinds aside roughly and threw the window open. Fred jumped back. Oh, shit, she cried. You scared the hell out of me. I thought you were your mom. Were you really going to climb up my bedroom window? Yeah, Fred said. I should have worn pants, huh? Come to the back door, Bridget sighed as she walked from the bedroom to the kitchen. Okay, so her relationship with Fred was a big secret, one she would rather die than let Jessamine, or worse, the other girls on the basketball team, know. When she went away to college, Fred would be American history, like the textbook she'd been studying, but damn it, there was something sweet about a girl who would climb in through your bedroom window and was kind of like Romeo and Juliet, only more like Juliet and Juliet. She opened the back door, letting Fred in. As they passed through the kitchen, Bridget grabbed two coffee mugs. She poured one for Fred and one for herself. They sat close together on the couch, knees touching. Fred picked up Bridget's textbook and frowned. Were you actually up studying? Why not? I don't sleep anymore. Just because you've dropped out of school doesn't mean everybody has to. I still plan to be something other than a junkie the rest of my life. The remark, so offhand, so casual, caught Fred off guard. What? Are you saying I'm nothing but a junkie? Bridget shook her head violently. No, no, not you. You're an artist, Fred. You're so talented. And not only your paintings, either. You could probably play violin with the symphony orchestra if you tried. Picking up Fred's long, pale fingers, she added gently, All of them are on smack, anyway. It's a musician thing. Fred had to laugh. She rolled the textbook over in her hand, studying the American flag on the cover. At last, she said, Isn't the United States of America the stupidest name you've ever heard of? For a country, I mean. Pridget rested the book from her. No, what are you talking about? Think about it. What does United States of America mean? That we're some states, we're united somehow, and that we're in America. America could be anywhere on the continents of North or South America, so that's not specific enough. And the part about the states doesn't narrow it down either. Mexico has United States, too. So does Canada, except they call them provinces. It's not even a name. It's a vague description. It's so generic, like naming a country, country. Bridget laughed. So what do you want to call it, then? Frida land. Freedom land. I like that. She put the history book down on the table. Fred didn't feel like correcting her. But it's not just the vagueness, she went on. It's the arrogance. Just because we take up one badly named part of the continent, we call ourselves Americans. People from Peru are Americans. 
Yet, if you went to Europe and told people you were American, they wouldn't ask North or South. They'd assume you were from the United States. That must be galling to Peruvians. Galling, Bridget interrupted. That's a big word for you, Fred. Fred stared at her. Seriously, though, in Spanish, they have the word estadounidense to describe people from the United States. The English language doesn't have a word like United Statesian. So what do we do? Appropriate the nationality that rightfully belongs to everyone from Alaska to Patagonia. I've never heard of Patagonia, Bridget admitted. I think it's the southernmost part of South America, Fred explained. But I didn't come here to talk about geography. What do you want to do tonight, Belle, besides studying for your history midterm? What could a couple of lovely young ladies do together in the middle of the night when my mom's not home? She started to unbutton her shirt. Fred smiled. I can think of a few things. She leaned in close and kissed Bridget's lips. Bridget pulled her even closer. As their kisses grew hotter, Fred pulled her black hoodie over her head and threw it on the coffee table. Bridget ran her fingers up and down Fred's scarred arms, then down the front of Fred's thin white t-shirt, until she started tugging at the drawstring of Fred's skirt. Fred drew her lips from Bridget's weight, she said. I have to tell you something first. I'm having my period. Bridget looked confused. She wrinkled up her nose. You still have periods? You don't? Sometimes. I haven't for the last couple months, though. But that's pretty normal when you're on smack, isn't it? Fred was shaking her head. Fred's fists were clenched. Bridget could tell something serious was going on in Fred's mind. How long have you been using, she said quietly. Bridget shrugged. I've been experimenting off and on since you and I started hanging out together. I tried it a few times last school year, right before you dropped out. That was what, like seven or eight months ago? But you didn't stop having periods seven or eight months ago. I don't know. I've always been irregular. But I haven't had a period in the last two or three months. She looked worried. Is there something wrong with me, Fred? Is it something bad? Fred was on the verge of tears now, angry tears. Is there something else you want to tell me, Bridget? She said through clenched teeth. That night I caught you in his bedroom. Were you doing something else? Something you forgot to tell me about? Fred grabbed Bridget's arm and began to shake her. Bridget pulled away angrily, standing up. I think you should go now. Bridget felt sick. She stood up from the couch and ran for the bathroom, knocking the pot of coffee off the table as she went. As Bridget leaned over the toilet, she heard Fred run by the bathroom door, then back to the living room. A moment later, Fred stood in the doorway. Was it Leander? Bridget shook her head. Not him, but someone else. God, I don't believe you. You've been lying to me and screwing some guy or guys. How big of a slut are you, Bridget? It's not like that at all. It was one guy, one time. I had a few beers at work, and you know I can't hold my liquor at all. I can't even remember it. You're lying, Fred said, leaning her body against the sink. Was it that skinny bus boy, the one whose brother plays basketball? Oh, God, please tell me it wasn't Jerry. I think I'm going to be sick. She pushed off from the sink and paced back and forth across the vinyl floor. Bridget watched her feet. I met him at Keaton's, Bridget said quietly. Not someone who works there, a customer. He was there with his wife and they left, but he came back for me. In a weird way, I kind of think he loves me. Bridget looked up. Fred was sneering at her. I believed you when you said you loved me, she said. Now look at you. You're pregnant and your baby's dad is married. You don't even know his name, do you? His name is Edward, she said. Lorraine at the restaurant told me he was on TV. Fred stopped pacing. On TV? Like a weather guy or something? Not a weatherman, a TV preacher, Bridget said. Fred dropped to the floor, sitting Indian style, and looked Bridget in the eyes. What did you do, she said. She was crying now. Bridget, this is a seriously morally depraved situation. How could you? Somebody like Leander, I can understand, but somebody with a wife, a ministry, how could he? Bridget made herself keep looking in Fred's eyes. Promise me you won't tell anyone, she said. We, we don't know anything yet. If I am pregnant, I'll fix it. But this has to be our secret. Fred shook her head. I need to talk to Father Shelby, she said. She paced in tight circles. 
You are so full of shit, Bridget Bell. You haven't had a period in months. You must be deep in denial if you've been blaming it on drugs this whole time. You're not stupid. You knew what was going on. She reached for the door. Don't go, Bridget begged. She felt then that once Fred walked out the door, she wouldn't be coming back. She tried to make herself cry, but the tears wouldn't come. Tell me one thing, Fred answered, turning her back to Bridget. Was there even a moment when you really loved me, or have you been using me to score? Bridget thought before she spoke. I cared about you, Bridget said. Fred nodded. Goodbye, Bridget. Have a very happy life. She closed the bathroom door. A moment later, Bridget heard the back door slam. Bridget got up and sat down on the couch. She picked up the towel Fred had thrown over the spilled coffee. Underneath, her history notes were soaked, ruined, like my life, thought Bridget. All of the thoughts she'd been forbidding herself to think suddenly came to Bridget uninvited. When was she with Edward? Three. No, two months ago. If she was two months pregnant, and oh, God, she'd better not be, she wouldn't start to show for maybe another month? She could hide it for now. It certainly wasn't too late to get an abortion, but she couldn't be pregnant. She made him use a condom. Oh, God, she said to herself. They told us in health class that only works like 85% of the time. Why do I have to be in the other 15%? How would she tell Coach Longley? Or Jessamine? She couldn't tell Jessamine. Maybe she was all worked up about nothing. The only sensible thing to do now was to find out whether there was even anything to worry about. She would go to the all-night drugstore and buy a pregnancy test. Bridget searched the kitchen table for the keys to Jessamine's Jetta. She felt a stab of guilt. Fred was gone, and maybe forever. She found the keys and got in the car. Without any all-night drugstores in Bridget's neighborhood, she had to drive north, nearer the campus of St. Helena's. As she drove, Bridget thought about the night Fred came to her, face lined with black mascara tear stains and told her she was dropping out of high school. Bridget had understood. It wasn't easy for Fred, constantly being called a freak, a dyke, and worse. That night they had held each other and cried together. Fred was a good girl, but she was gone. Bridget didn't know who she could cry to now, not Jessamine. Letting her mother know that she'd made the exact same stupid mistake Jessamine had made was out of the question. She reached the drugstore. Hers was the only car in the parking lot. Looking around, she ran into the store. The night clerk, a reed-thin man with long, lank brown hair and a name tattooed on his neck, greeted her. Marcus, his neck said, or possibly Melvin? The cursive was hard to read. She eyed him coldly and pretended to be looking at a display of nail polish. Sweating, she made her way to the back of the store. Bridget looked up and saw an enormous mirror above the aisle with the condoms and pregnancy tests. She could see the clerk's reflection in it. He was thumbing through a magazine, so she closed her eyes and selected one of the test kits. She set it down on the counter. The clerk smiled. Congratulations, he said with a knowing smirk. Yeah, thanks, Bridget said wearily. She got back in the car and drove. She didn't know where she was going. Some place that had coffee, she supposed. Some place quiet where she could sit, weep, drink, and get up to pee. Out of the corner of her eye, Bridget spotted the green sign of the Phoenix Cafe. Chapter 19, November 1999 Diana and Tim went on their third official date the last week of November. They'd been talking on the phone and had met for lunch a few times over the past month, but, to Diana's regret, she didn't have much free time. She was really looking forward to this date. Tim didn't disappoint her. He took her to the planetarium, where they kissed under the artificial stars. Then back to Keaton's. Tim reserved the same table they'd had on their first date. After dinner, they went to Diana's apartment. She took his jacket and hung it in the closet next to hers. They took their shoes off and left them side by side at the front door. Diana walked into the living room, and Tim followed her. Your apartment is nice, he said. It's really clean. I meant to tell you that the last time. Thanks, she said. I try. Would you like something to drink? Sure, whatever you've got. A half wall separated the kitchen from the living room. Diana went into the kitchen and looked in the fridge, 
while Tim made himself comfortable on the couch. She was out of Diet Cokes. The only other thing to drink in there was beer, and Tim wouldn't go for that. Hot tea, she said. Sounds great. Hey, that's right. You don't have a TV. I don't have time to watch TV, Diana said. I'm always busy with work and with school. She immediately regretted saying it. She didn't want Tim thinking that she didn't have time for him. Diana filled the tea kettle with water and set it on the stove. That's cool, he said. I watch too much TV. And not even anything good. I'll watch whatever's on, just so I don't have to feel like I'm alone with my own thoughts. After she'd put the tea bags into the last two clean mugs, Diana went into the living room and sat next to him on the couch. That sounds lonely, she said. I feel that way sometimes, too. But I put on the radio. The university has a student radio station with some pretty good programs. Oh, I know. I listen to it sometimes when I'm meditating. I've done a lot of meditating since I got shot. After a moment, the tea kettle whistled. Diana got up to pour the water. Tim looked down at his hands and laughed. I keep bringing up all these deep, heavy things. You seem like a nice girl, Diana. You don't want to hear about all this serious shit, do you? I'm a big girl. I can handle a little truth, she said from the kitchen. Sugar? Yes, please. She spooned a generous helping of sugar into both mugs and left the tea to steep. Secretly, she wondered if the tea would be left to steep all night, forgotten. So, did you have fun at the university the other night? Yeah. I know the pagans were a little weird, but believe it or not, their ceremonies are very meaningful to me. Even if it was just a bonfire and some music? When you grow up not believing in anything, it feels really good to be part of a community that has faith. He nodded. I had a good time, too. And again tonight. I especially like the part where I got to kiss you. You're listening to episode 12 of Cut by Aaron O'Reardon and Ted Ellington. Thanks for listening. When episode 13 is ready, you can click on the link right here. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and be sure to give us a thumbs up. Thanks, and have a great day.